Hello and welcome to Numerous to Cool. We are continuing our series on machine learning for business. In the first video of that series, we presented a framework for supervised learning and we talked a lot about the different kind of predictions you might make in different supervised learning problems. Uh, it's often thought that you know a, a prediction is just a simple known quantity, but what we saw is that there are actually a lot of different kinds of predictions that you can make in a particular problem. Uh, in this video, what we're going to do is go through the metrics which correspond to those different kinds of predictions. So we're going to talk a little bit about metrics overall, and then we're really going to home in on metrics for classification in this video. And we'll also go through some examples where metrics can be misleading and how the different metrics are measuring different aspects of the predictions. So I hope you'll find this really useful and helpful. Um, in the meantime, before we get into it, if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel, that would be really helpful. And with that said, let's get into the lecture. Now we're going to talk about some of the metrics that you would use in evaluating classification models and their predictions. But first, let's give an overview of how metrics are used in supervised learning. So the term metric refers to a number which quantifies the performance of a model. Typically, when we're talking about the performance of a model, we mean the performance of a specific set of predictions from that model. In supervised learning, there's a few different ways in which metrics are used. Now, the most common one you might hear of is as a loss function during training. So in many methods, the way the current model works is by minimizing some loss function, that loss function is a performance metric says, how well do we think this model does on this training set? And often in some algorithms, like in deep learning and in gradient boosting, you'll actually repeatedly evaluate the model against the training set and evaluate some metric, some loss function. And then you'll use the results of that evaluation to make changes to improve the model. So in deep learning, this takes the form of back propagation in gradient boosting, this takes the form of fitting the next tree to the gradients of the loss function of the previous model. Now, metrics are also used to compare different models or different variants of a model. So we might have a, several different models that use different features or use different, uh, different methods altogether. We might want to say, which one do we think is better? And we might use a metric to determine which one we think is better. Furthermore, we might want to set certain hyperparameters of a model. And we might say, here's a model with a certain settings of hyperparameters. Here's a model with another set of hyperparameters. Which one does the best on the holdout set? That's the model I'm going to go with. So in both of these cases, the model is evaluated on out-of-sample data, data that is not part of the training set. And a final way you might use a metric is this to, to try to give a sense of the general quality of a model. So for example, you might say this model is 99% accurate, and hopefully that means that this is a good model. And one thing to keep in mind is that for a particular problem, you might use different metrics in these different roles. The model that you use as your training loss function may not be the metric that you use as the, the one to judge the, the quality of its overall performance on, in the real world. So what are some of the metrics we use in classification? Well, the metrics you use are specific to the type of prediction. So remember, we talked about these three different kinds of predictions, the hard predictions, the ranking predictions, and the probabilistic predictions. And there's also distinctions in whether we're talking about a binary classification problem or a multi-class classification problem. So let's start with the hard predictions. So what are some of the common metrics for hard predictions? Remember, this means that for every data point, we've just guessed which class we think uh, the outcome Y is in. We're just guessing what we think the answer is. If it's a yes or no, we're guessing yes or no. It's a multi-class problem for guessing the particular class that we think the answer is. So perhaps the most common metric for hard predictions is accuracy, which just says, what's the percentage of the observations that we correctly predicted? This is a very common natural metric. We've all took tests in school. 
and accuracy was basically the metric that was used. What percentage of the questions did you get right? Now, a second metric that's used, and this is used in, usually in conjunction with other metrics, um, but we'll talk first about precision. Precision specifically separates out the, the yeses from the noes and it asks the following question. It says, when the model predicted a yes, let's look at all of those yes predictions, what percentage of those were actually true? What percentage of the time is the model right when it predicted yes? Now, complementary to that is a recall. This says, of all the yeses that you have, what percentage did the model correctly label as yes? So, uh, in one, the denominator, in precision, the denominator is the things the model guessed was a yes. And in recall, the denominator is the things that are actually yes. And we'll go through an example soon. I should point out that precision and recall are often traded off against each other. So if you have a very high threshold, you can often have high precision, but a low recall. Or you could cast a very wide net and get high recall, perhaps at the cost of having low precision. Now, sensitivity is another word you might see. This is the same thing as recall. It's the exact same definition. Now, specificity is different. Specificity asks the question, what percentage of the actual no's were correctly labeled as no? And finally, there's something called the F-score. The F-score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. So it's basically a way of saying, if I have this trade-off between precision and recall, and I want to summarize this by one number, it kind of favors things where precision is close to recall, but prefers the numbers to be as big as possible. Now, in addition to metrics, there's something I like to call a diagnostic, which is something you might use to, to diagnose your model, to see its performance, to see uh, where it's doing well and where it's doing poorly, but it's, it doesn't reduce to a single number. So a common diagnostic in classification problems for hard predictions is the confusion matrix. So this is where you look at the counts of all the times I predicted a particular value, what was the actual value. So when you have numbers on the diagonal, that means you predicted, you got the answer right. The class you predicted was the class that it actually was. When you're off the diagonal, it means you made a mistake. You thought it was a cat, but it was actually a hamster. So looking at these, while they don't reduce to a single number, so don't consider them a metric, they are useful for assessing the performance of your model. Let's run through a quick example to show how these metrics would behave on the actual problem. So let's again take a fraud detection example where we've got 10,000 transactions and we've built the model and we've trained it, we've set some threshold and we said, if your score is above this threshold, I'm going to declare this to be a fraud case. And so the model declares fraud 50 times. There were 50 cases out of 10,000 that clear this threshold. And the model was correct on 35 of those 50 cases. So 35 of the 50 where it alerted, it actually was fraud. The other 15, it was not. But there were a total of 60 fraudulent transactions. So there's an additional 25 cases that the model did not catch. So this is what the confusion matrix would look like in this case, where the rows represent our predictions and the columns represent the actual status of that transaction. So you can see that we predicted fraud 50 times, we were right 35 times, and we were wrong 15 times. But there were also a total of 60 fraud cases, 35 of which we caught and 25 of which we did not catch. And there were 9,925, the remainder, cases that we did not uh, alert on and that were not fraud. So let's look at our metrics. The precision here would be 35 out of 50, or 0.7, whereas the recall will be 35 out of 60, or 0.583. Note that the numerator is the same in each case. 
the difference is the denominator. The denominator in precision is the number of things we predicted to be fraud, whereas the denominator in recall is the number of actual fraud cases. The S score here is 0.636. That's the harmonic mean of those two numbers. And the specificity here, you can see, is quite high. It's 9925 9, or 9940 ends up being 0.9985. So it's a very high number. So it's given us a lot of credit for the fact that we uh, you know, correctly labeled as legitimate the vast majority of the legitimate transactions. So this is where, because this is a very imbalanced problem, there's much more legitimate transactions than our fraudulent problems. This specificity sometimes can, can seem a little bit optimistic, right? Our precision was 0.7, pretty good. Recalls 58% also. Okay, not spectacular, but not terrible. But the specificity is this very, very high number. And similarly, accuracy is this very high number. So accuracy says, take the numbers on the diagonal, add them together. That's the things you labeled correctly. And divide that by the total number of transactions. So we got 99.6% of the labels right. But again, it's giving us a lot of credit for labeling legitimate transactions as legitimate, which you know, doesn't make a ton of sense because uh, it's so, such an imbalanced problem. And we'll talk about that a little more later. OK, so that's, those are metrics for hard predictions. Next, let's talk about the metrics we would use when we have a ranking prediction. So typically, these metrics will work by averaging or maximizing over different choices of thresholds. So if you remember, we discussed before that when you've got a ranking prediction, you could convert it into a hard prediction by choosing a threshold and declaring everything above that threshold to be a yes and everything below that threshold to be no. And in fact, that's how most hard predictions, most algorithms arrive at their hard predictions. It's really through some choice of a threshold. So Probably the most common metric used for ranking predictions is the AUROC, area under the ROC curve. This is sometimes just called the AUC or the C statistic. And the ROC curve essentially plots sensitivity versus specificity. Actually, it's one minus specificity. But the idea is to see the trade-off between sensitivity and specificity. Another way to understand the AURC number is to say it's the percentage of yes-no pairs that we correctly order. So let's think about what that means. In the previous case, we had 60 actual fraud cases and 9,940 uh, legitimate cases. Now suppose I randomly picked one of the fraud cases and randomly picked one of the legitimate cases, and then I checked to see whether I gave the fraud case a higher risk score than the legitimate case. And I repeated this over and over again. So I did it for every possible yes, no pair. What percentage of the time did I get it right? That's equivalent to the AUROC number. Another way to think about AUROC is it kind of averages sensitivity across different thresholds or specificity across different thresholds. And there's a some details on how to say that precisely that I won't get into right here. Another metric that's used is the maximum F-score. So we talked about this F-score for a particular uh, set of hard predictions. You can imagine changing the threshold over all possible values and seeing which one gives you the best F-score. And that's also another metric that might be used to evaluate the quality of a ranking. Now there are also some diagnostics that go along with ranking predictions. Again, these are things that don't reduce to a single number, but help us assess the performance. So one is the ROC curve itself. If you look at the ROC curve, it might give you more information than just the number, because you might see certain areas where it uh, has higher performance or lower performance. For example, it might a um, uh, model might do well at very uh, low sensitivity. So you might be able to get very, very high precision at low sensitivity, but as you increase the sensitivity, the precision, the specificity of precision drops off dramatically. 
Another diagnostic is the precision recall curve. So this, as we saw, specificity can sometimes be a little bit optimistic. So sometimes it's useful to look at a precision recall curve because precision perhaps gives a little bit more uh, tangible and useful information as to when I sounded the alert, how often was I right? That's perhaps a more useful number than the specificity. Now, I should also say people do sometimes look at the area under the precision recall curve, although there has been some arguments that this has some mathematical problems, so it's not used quite as commonly. Finally, let's talk about the metrics we would use for probabilistic predictions. Now here there's one very dominant choice of metric, and that's the log loss, which is also called the cross entropy. And this is the negative average log of the predicted probabilities of the true values. So it's kind of a mouthful. We're going to go through an example in a minute. But the idea roughly is, think about the probability that your model assigned to what actually happened, take the logs of them, take the negations of them, and average them. We'll go through an example soon. A second one I should talk about is the Breyer score. So the Breyer score is essentially the mean squared error between your probability of yes and the actual answer, where one is yes and zero is no. Now, the fundamental difference between these two is that log loss punishes overconfidence more. So if you very confidently say this is very, very, a particular outcome is very, very unlikely, and it does happen, log loss will punish you very severely for that mistake. Whereas the Breyer score, by its formulation, your error is set at a, at a maximum of one. So you're sort of bounded in how much you could be punished for being overconfident. Whereas with log loss, you could actually have infinite uh, loss if you predict something's never going to happen and it actually does happen. Then one diagnostic I want to talk about when you're dealing with probabilistic predictions is uh, the reliability diagram. And this is used to assess calibration. So what do we mean by calibration? Well, if you remember, we talked about the difference between probabilistic predictions, where we expect the number to be an actual probability, and these ranking predictions, where we might have some score, but the score is really just useful for ranking cases as more or less likely. The reliability diagram helps us assess when we said this is a probability of 0.3, is it actually giving us a 30% probability in the long run? or are we off by a little bit? So this helps us distinguish when a, when a score is really behaving as a probability versus when it's just being used as a score. So that's why you might uh, look at a reliability diagram when you have probabilistic predictions to see if your probabilities are really bearing out in the long run. Let's give an example of log loss versus prior score to show in more detail how they're calculated and also this distinction between how log loss punishes over confidence. So let's just assume we have three data points, y1, y2, y3, three outcomes. Model A gave the following fraud probability. So we're going to use this fraud detection motif again. So uh, y1, y2, and y3 are transactions. If they're, they're equal one, if they're fraudulent, they equal zero if they're not fraudulent. Model A said 30% for Y1 that it's fraud, 60% for Y2, 80% for Y3. Model B gave probabilities of 0.1, 0.2, and 0.9 to those three cases. And as it turned out, case one was fraud, case two is not fraud, and case three was fraud. So for model A, what would be the log loss? Well, we have to look at the probability of what actually happened. So you see in the first case, it was fraud. We gave a probability of 30% for fraud. So we take the log of 0.3. For the second case, uh, we gave a probability of 0.6 for fraud, but it was not fraud. So that means we thought it was 40% chance of fraud, of being not fraud. We gave a probability of 0.4 to it not being fraud, and that's what it was. So therefore, we put a log of 
And in the third case, we gave 80% chance of fraud and it was fraud, so we take log of 1.8. Add up those logs, divide by three, put a minus sign in front of it, we get 0.781. Now model B, we do the same exercise. We get log of 0.1 plus log of 0.8 plus log of 0.9, negated, divided by three, and we get a higher value. So remember, it's a loss, so higher values are worse. So according to log loss, model B was a worse model than model A. Now what's interesting is model B did better on two out of the three cases, right? It, for the second case, it gave a much higher probability that it was not fraud, and it was indeed not fraud. And for the third case, it gave a modestly higher probability of fraud, and it was fraud. But for the first case, it, it gave only a 10% chance of fraud versus model A giving a 30% chance. So the way log loss deals with those numbers is it really punishes that overconfidence. So, so model B was quite sure that that first thing was not fraud, and it was. So it really punished model B a lot for making that mistake. And that the cost of that mistake outweighed its better performance on the following two data points. Now, if we look at Breyer's score, we see that the first case was a one, was fraud, and uh, we gave a 0.3 probability of fraud. So our cost for that case is 0.7 squared. For the second case, it would be 0.6 squared, because it wasn't fraud. And for the third case, it would be 0.2 squared, gives us a Breyer score of 0.297. Whereas model B, plugging in the different numbers, you get 0.287. So according to Breyer's score, model B was a little bit better because it doesn't punish that first mistake quite so severely. Now, why is log loss so, so ubiquitous, so commonly used? And the reason why is it really has deep connections to maximum likelihood and information theory. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where this comes from. And to start that conversation, I want to talk about something called the likelihood principle. So the likelihood principle says, given two models, A and B, that makes a bunch of predictions, you want to favor the model that gave higher likelihood to what actually happened. So to start very simply, imagine you have a weather forecasting model or two weather forecasting models. Model A says there's a 30% chance of rain tomorrow. Model B says there's a 1% chance of rain tomorrow. Tomorrow it rains. That suggests limited data, but based on what happened so far, we would say model A is better. It gave a higher probability to what actually happened. And as we have more test data, this would give the models more and more occasions to compete against each other and you'd have a little bit more faith that whichever model is doing better is indeed better in, in, in the long run. So you can imagine we did this for one day. Let's say we did this for 100 days or 1,000 days. Compare the, the probabilities of the predictions of the different models. Whichever model gave higher probabilities to what actually happened, we would say that's a more convincing model. So how does likelihood tie into log loss? Well, again, imagine we have this test set uh, of X and Y pairs. And now we're going to say let PI be the model's probability of what actually happened. So this is the probability your model gave to what actually happened for data point I. So the, when we say y equals yi, we mean the probability our model gave to on y equals the true value for that data point. So what would the likelihood be? Well, if you remember from any probability or statistics classes you might have taken, the likelihood means you just multiply out the probabilities that, uh, that your model assigned to all these different data points. So we would take the product of the probabilities for all these data points. Now, often it's cumbersome to work with the likelihood because we're multiplying 
lots of probabilities. Probabilities are all between 0 and 1. So every time we multiply more probabilities, we get a smaller and smaller number. And as we start multiplying out a lot of probabilities, we end up getting very small numbers that, if you're working on a computer, will cause underflow. You've got numbers that are so close to 0, the computer kind of can't keep track of them. So it's common to instead work with log likelihood. Now, if a number has log is what's called a monotonic function. So if my if model A has a higher likelihood than model B, it will also have a higher log likelihood than model B. So we just stick a log in front of that product. And by the properties of logs, this equals the sum of the logs of the individual probabilities. So we take the log of the entire likelihood and that tells us to add up the logs of the individual probabilities. And this is easier to work with now because we won't run into this uh, numerical underflip problem. However, there's still two, two minor problems in working with log likelihood. One is that we're now taking logs of probabilities. Again, probabilities are between 0 and 1. The log of a number between 0 and 1 is going to be a negative number. So we're going to be adding up a bunch of negative numbers. And then we're in this somewhat awkward position of saying a bigger log likelihood is the negative number with smaller magnitude. So this is kind of awkward to say. For example, we're not used to saying negative 3 is bigger than negative 5. It's true, but it's more, more natural to say that 3 is less than 5. So what we do is we put a minus sign in front of it, and then instead of saying that minus 3 is better than minus 5, we say that 3 is better than 5. We treat it as a loss. We put a minus sign in front of it. We treat it as a loss function instead of uh, something we want to maximize. And this makes our life a little bit simpler. The second thing we want to do is to say, well, I want this number to be meaningful independent of the size of the data set. So I'm going to average over the number of data points. So from this, we get log loss, which says take that log likelihood, put a minus sign in front of it, and divide by the number of data points. And this will give us a number that is positive, that uh, is a loss function, so lower is better. And since we're scaling by the number of data points, it, it will have this property that's generally comparable across data sets of different sizes. And this is exactly the log loss or the empirical cross entropy. Next, let's talk a little bit about where these metrics can go wrong or can mislead. And we've seen a little bit of this already, but we're going to uh, show again an example of where these metrics can be very misleading. So metrics can make performance look good even when it's not. So again, let's imagine a fraud detection. Let's really scale up the number of transactions. Though. Let's say we have 100 million transactions and 10,000 of them are fraud. Now, if I said I have a model that's 99.99% accurate at detecting fraud, your initial reaction might be, hey, that sounds pretty good. Let's, I'd like to buy that product. Um, but if you dive deeper into this, you realize you can get 99.99% accuracy just by saying, there's no fraud. I'm going to just label everything as legitimate. And since very few things of the, are actually fraud, I will, I will have 99.99% accuracy because 99.99% of them are legitimate. So this is a common way that people will use metrics to make their, their models sound better than they really Now, even AUC can similarly sound optimistic. And this is because, as we saw before, that specificity number can be very optimistic. So imagine I had a fraud detection model, and uh, I said its, it's uh, AUROC was bigger than 0.995. And you might think, wow, this must be a really, really good fraud detection algorithm. But in fact, you could achieve such a high AUC value even with a precision of less than 0.01. So in other words, you could achieve that AUC and still have a model which gives 99 false positives or more for every fraud case that it catches.
Thanks for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. In the next, uh, the next video, we're going to talk about the metrics for regression problems and go through the different, uh, the different metrics which correspond to the different kind of regression predictions that we talked about earlier. So I hope you'll join me for that. Uh, in the meantime, if you ha haven't had a chance, please uh, like the video and subscribe to the channel. It would really help me out. And I'll see you in the next video.